Hello everyone and uh, thank you for joining my today uh, session. Uh, I'm excited to be here and uh, happy to share with you our uh, case study around uh, how to implement uh, security development life cycle into the agile process. So, let's begin. So, coming to speak about security development life cycle uh, in Agile, some may think that this is a mission impossible. There are few misconceptions around the security development life cycle in Agile, such, for example, uh, that fuzzing uh, takes too much time, and uh, since the Agile process is in a fast pack, and you need to ship the, the release uh, very, in a very fast uh, pack, uh, you don't have enough time to implement all your uh, security controls. Also, some other misconception about uh, the adaptive way that uh, uh, Agile uh, approach is about uh, may uh, uh, limit you uh, by implementing the right uh, security controls. Here is a, an example of a very familiar vendor that published in his uh, website what he thinks about security development lifecycle. And I'm sure that this uh, vendor is used in many, uh, many companies that uh, are developing uh, in the day to day. So it says, uh, it is well known and acknowledged fact that agile processes are extremely difficult to combine with any existing security frameworks. And when you keep reading on the blog, you find this additional uh, sentence that say, the good news is that our retroactive security is very good. So on my today's presentation, I hope uh, I, I'm sure that I'm going to prove you that uh, security development lifecycle in Agile is more than doable. Uh, I will uh, present and uh, share with you our, uh, our practice of how we did this. Uh, this is not the only way to do this. There are a lot of flavor of, of how to do this. It works for us and I hope you will uh, benefit from it and inspire to use it for your own SDLC program at home. A few things about myself, few details. Uh, I'm in the industry for more than 20 years. In the last four years, I'm uh, focused on building the SDLC program at Life Person. Uh, in the past, I used to design a large network and implement security within, within it. Uh, feel free to contact me to uh, the details that are shown uh, in the slide. <clears throat> to give you some color about what is, uh, what is security for life person, let's first understand uh, who we are and uh, what we do. So, life person is a SaaS platform that creates a meaningful connection through real-time engagement. We are in the industry 16 years, we are SaaS, day, uh, SaaS from the first day. Uh, we are public. We have uh, a lot of customers in different verticals, and we will elaborate on this uh, a bit. And we have 800 employees. When I came to Life Person four years ago, we were about 200 employees and grew up up to 800 employees, which is a challenge by itself uh, in terms of governance and how you uh, manage your SDLC program uh, in general. <clears throat> so, how the solution works? We monitor our uh, visitor on our customer website, and since we monitor all this traffic, we manage to see one and a half billion uh, unique visitors coming to our customer websites. So it's a lot of traffic, a lot of performance issue uh, that is uh, hitting our uh, data centers. At the right moment, uh, we uh, choose uh, the right uh, visitor to engage with and offer him uh, the right channel to engage with. 
could be a voice, chat, video, uh, or uh, any coupons or other channels that uh, are available on our platform. Meaning that the right moment, the real time, and performance are big issue for the service itself in order to be efficient and give our customer the right value. Each month we interact with more than 10 million uh, different uh, visitors by chat and all these chats are stored on our data centers. And for a security guy that needs to deal with this uh, type of information, this is re really a challenge. Our customers are coming from different verticals, can come from a big finance institute, uh, and uh, uh, we have also telco, we have uh, health uh, companies and others, and we operate globally. We operate, we have many customers in the US, in Europe, and now we are fast going on APAC. This is a real challenging when we are speaking about Compliances. Our customer needs to stay compliance. If you are uh, speaking about big financial institute, they have uh, keep updating regulation coming from the OCC, other regulation that they need to meet for internal uh, use and for uh, the regulator itself. And dealing with all this, uh, if we will not provide the right uh, security uh, controls, uh, we will not manage to do business. So this understanding means that security is not optional for a life person. Security is part of our DNA. By understanding this, the outline of this one is that the decision making on our uh, company understand this very well. And this help us a lot in order to drive our security development life cycle and we get the right support from our management to do so. Creating the value to your uh, management and to your decision making uh, will help you drive your security development life cycle in the right path for, for your own, uh, for your own uh, service. The first thing you need to know uh, before you even start to implement your security development lifecycle is like you're doing in your agile uh, process. First, you go to a discovery phase. The first discovery phase that you need to do is to understand how your, uh, how, how, uh, your operating in terms of the different entities in your organization, deciphering well the flows that are in your uh, organization. Here are the key players uh, that take part in uh, life person. This is a high level. I'm sure that everybody can adjust to, to his uh, own organization. We have the sales and product that here the customer needs, that here the, the, uh, the market needs and they uh, formulate it and compile it into user stories that comes uh, into the different Scrum teams. Sometimes the user story are easy to understand and we can match the user story directly to the, to the relevant Scrum teams, but sometimes the user stories are more complicated and we need first to uh, uh, understand and find out which uh, relevant Scrum teams it needs to, to fall into. So to do so, we have uh, the software architect and the system architect to support the product uh, to identify and to break uh, to small chunks of the user story and create new user story for each Scrum. Life person contains today, includes today, uh, uh, 22 Scrum teams and about 200 developers um, in R&D. Each Scrum team, of course, uh, includes members uh, such as Scrum Master, uh, Product Owner, uh, QA, and developers teams. <laughs> when you speak about uh, this flow, you understand that 
It's right. Agile, it's about adaptive approach of how you develop your things. But it's not a chaos. You, you walk in an environment that it's a, a, a stable framework that uh, allows the different Scrum to add more of the same to this uh, infrastructure. From time to time, you need to establish new API or new, uh, new connection or interaction between the different uh, subsystem. And for this, uh, you will need guidance and assistance from the software architect and from the system architect. You cannot, uh, as a Scrum, decide that you want to go with a new uh, type of database. And today we have so many flavors. If we are speaking about big data, you can have Cassandra, you can have Hadoop, other use MongoDB, and you can find yourself putting a lot of friction into the system. So it's not a chaos. We have our software architect and we have our system architect that decide together what is the best approach to address new interaction between the different sub subsystem. After everybody is happy and knows what needs to be done, uh, the developer sits to, to create the, the relevant code and uh, tr start to push it into the, the infrastructure, meaning we have, today we have around, we have more than 100 uh, different builds uh, unique builds that uh, comes into our continuous integration environment and from this continuous in, uh, integration environment uh, automatically are uh, pushed to the artifactory and set the right artifact and from there uh, in an automated way we push it to production and finally find our happy customer use the, the new user story. After we cover a bit about how flows are going, and I didn't forget the security team in this slide, because the security team, and this is part of the message that I'm bringing, should be in each part of the process. You cannot put security team above, you cannot put security team under, after, before. It should be part of the process and you need to be present. You don't have, need to be present in person, but you need to be present in all the part of the process during the build itself. So after we cover a bit about the flows, let's see how uh, Scrum uh, uh, acts. So this is nothing new. This is a standard slide of Agile. Uh, you have uh, the product backlog that we spoke about, come into the spring backlog, you choose your uh, user stories that needs to be uh, provided in the coming release, and in a period of between of two to four weeks, you have, uh, you have daily meetings of the, of the team taking the relevant task for for doing uh, in, in this specific day and monitoring what was uh, covered and see that they are uh, on, on the right uh, path to, to ship the, the release uh, on time. Of course, once uh, this process ends, the, there is an evaluation and if something is missing, it goes back to the spring backlog for the next release. Into this uh, process, uh, we decided uh, internally to find out what are the checkpoints that needs to uh, be addressed during this sprint uh, process. And we attach for each checkpoint the right uh, control. So at the, at the face of the release planning, we start with security high level design. Oh, security high level design, it's about identify the risk. And the risk is not uh, just the standard risk that uh, most of you 
probably uh, aware of, such as uh, input validation, the right session management, and I assume that if I will ask how you need to store your password in the database, everybody will know, and if not, it will find out in Google's in a few seconds that needs to be hashed, like uh, with uh, addressing the NIST standard, etc., etc. The, the thing is, is more take a high level understanding of what is your solution, what is the flow, what is the right manner to create API. Is it a, a, a stateless protocol or is it a session protocol? Uh, are you uh, going to interact with uh, third parties? Are you going to expose open, uh, open ID or, uh, or going to, to share a SAML uh, on your application? All of this needs to be good, uh, have a good understanding of what you are going to do in this specific user story. In addition, you need to understand a compliance issue. And let, let me give you an example. You want to uh, get benefit from geolocation solution, okay? But then you have customer sitting in Europe saying, you cannot, you cannot transfer our data out from Europe uh, for, uh, for data at rest. So here you have a problem. You cannot go with geolocation and start spreading the data and uh, affecting our customer uh, compliance. This is an issue uh, that could, could cause you lo loss of customer. And if you don't identify it at first before you even start to develop, you will be uh, in a deep problem uh, with your customer. Uh, of course, uh, user experience uh, usually done by the UI UX uh, people. But again, now you are uh, developing uh, security control. You want it to be consumed by your customers in an easy way. So you need to decide, are you a, a task driven in your uh, application, meaning you are now going to create an operator, so I will pop up the, the user and password complexity uh, for, for uh, my customer at the right uh, point when he got to this process. And this is also thinking about the business, thinking about how you need to, to do things uh, in the right way. So high level design, don't stay at the standard things like uh, input validation uh, and, and other stuff. You need to see the, the big picture the business picture, the compliance issue, the, the web application or, or application security. The next phase will be the sprint planning. After everybody understands what needs to be solved, we go to do some discovery phase. We start to uh, uh, define how we are going to address the, the needs and we will do so uh, during this uh, process. The developer will find himself uh, with some concerns or uh, constraints that we put at, at first, and will need to have some type of guidance of how to do things right. My message here is uh, build strong relationship with your R&D. Uh, and make yourself available at any time uh, to help them understand. And when, when I'm speaking about a good relationship, it's not, it don't start at the sprint planning. It starts when you train them, when you do some demos to, the, to, do, to your uh, developers and create awareness. This awareness will, uh, let, uh, we, will be a self-starter for the developers to start asking questions when they are uh, designing the, the solution. And this is a, a very important uh, step in the, in the process. The next one is when you come to do uh, actually the work. Okay, everybody knows what needs to be done. We spoke about it. We, we did a lot of meetings. Now it's the money time. Come to, uh, let's start work. And, and the developers uh, is asked to do, for example, input validation, which, which I will take this example through my, my uh, presentation. And during this uh, input validation, uh, we forced him to, to use uh, ISAPI, for example, as a framework. Building this as a 
from scratch each time if someone uh, already in the past uh, did it, it kn he knows that it creates some friction. You need to set the right properties to, to ISAPI uh, to, to define your regex each time and not each developer is very trained with this one. And when you have a so dynamic, uh, a so dynamic uh, a company that uh, uh, more and more developers are coming to, to your company, it's hard to uh, uh, keep the level of knowledge for all the, for all the developers. And this is something that I, I'm sure that everybody is facing in terms of how you keep your knowledge uh, in the organization. So what we did is actually we uh, compiled a set of utilities that can be easily consumed by the developers in a way that uh, will create uh, less friction and will be uh, good from the perspective of time consuming. After we set our policy into this set of utilities, we want to enforce it. We set the, the, the policy, now we want to see that everybody is, is working according to the, the policy that uh, we set in place. And in order to do so, we use uh, different tools, such as static code analysis. We use static code analysis uh, with a predefined heuristic that uh, verify that each input in the system uses only uh, the... the the, the utility that we provide. Meaning if some uh, developer decided to build his own input validation, putting his own regex, maybe the best regex ever, but it's not uh, the policy of the, of the company, uh, it will fail on the test. And why do we do, the, why do, we do so? Because we want to, to be able to control and unify the solution that we bring in the system in a manner that will be easy to maintain and easy to change uh, uh, when needed. Other aspects uh, of this is uh, when you create a project, you usually use open source. You create dependencies to your uh, project and by uh, fetching this, you may impact your uh, your security policy, your, and, and this could be in in few channels. We will speak about it in a few. Once we are happy with the code, we checked in the build uh, success. Uh, we do we run automated uh, security test uh, during these two steps, and during these uh, steps, uh, we actually. Uh, have a, visi a better visibility on, on the product and, and what is about to be released. At the end, we have a, a release and we have an external pen test. Some of you may say, okay, external pen test is an, uh, is an expensive, it's a long phase, it's a kind of problematic. So we, we run our uh, external penetration test, but we want uh, also to collaborate uh, with our customers and we are open uh, for penetration tests coming from our customers. They do it uh, for their reason to remain compliant with their internal uh, process. And by this we gain two things. One is transparency. We show our customer that we don't have any problem for them to run penetration test on our uh, uh, service and the other one is to improve ourselves and by doing this we gain our customer confident and just to give you an idea and, and numbers we run about 40 different uh, penetration tests a year coming from our customers meaning that we manage more than two penetration tests uh, monthly and it's a lot. And if we are looking in a time frame of a, an agile process, we are speaking about four weeks. So in four weeks, I am always on the run of some sort of a penetration test. Let's, after we understand what are the controls, let's dive into the coding and understand better what needs to be done. So when we speak about code, 
Usually we will think about the code that the developer puts into the code. But it's not only the, the code that uh, the developers puts in it, and we spoke about it a few seconds ago about the utilities that we provide, anti-SAMI, CSRF guard, all these frameworks uh, 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 that are provided to us by OASP or, or by internal uh, development, and we spoke about the controls that we can apply to it. But then again, you need to consume some dependencies and open sources into your code, which increase the amount of line of code that each uh, product contains. Our product, when I'm speaking about line of code, so line of code that are put from our developers can be from small uh, subsystem of about 30K line of code up to more than 1 million line of code. When you add to this uh, the line of codes coming from the open source, you increase the number of line of code and of course you uh, increase your vulnerability. So what we do is for each build we also uh, inspect the code which open source are consumed and we look about uh, what are uh, the open sources, what license they, they run to see that they are aligned with our legal uh, framework uh, we see if we use new open source in the, in the system and get alert about uh, the software architect. And we also uh, inspect it for vulnerabilities. Some of the open source that you uh, import to your, uh, to your code may contain well-known CVEs that you will never test it on a regular pass of QA. So this will help you create more visibility about what is your code. But then it doesn't end there. It, uh, you, are, you have also the delivered. And delivered, uh, I'm saying about, let's assume you are using Apache Tomcat. And you have some function, foo, A and B, calls this foo, and this foo is actually on on the Tomcat, on a specific model that you enabled. So you cannot see it not on your open source and you cannot see it on your static code analysis. It's somewhere there on the delivery. So at this point what we do is at the, at the, at the final artifact that uh, we provide, we scan it with Nesus to identify what modules were uh, enabled on this specific project and uh, if they are uh, vulnerable to some sort of uh, setting or well-known CVs or other uh, thing. This way you can screen your code uh, in multi-dimensional uh, view, seeing the codes coming in, the dependency you you bring in and uh, on what platform you are actually running. After we, we understand how we do this, let's focus on, on, the, on the code that the developer are using and see how we expose the API in a, in a what, what is the practice to, to expose it. So here is a slide that is from the OASP, of course, and uh, this slide describes how ESAP is exposing their API. They are a validator, encryptor, you can do randomize or other stuff that are used in, in, your, uh, in your code. But as I mentioned uh, before, using it from scratch will require an effort from your team uh, each time they want to, to use it. The other thing that uh, will concern you is where to put your uh, validation. And this is not an easy decision. And, and I'm telling this because we have a lot of test and fail until we decided what is the right approach. So for us, we decided the better solution will be to do a validation on the business function, meaning for each uh, input at the at, at the maximum resolution. And why do we do so? We do so for few reasons, and these are tips that uh, we learn from. First of all, to keep the regex and the input validation as simple as possible, to prevent any performance issue that may impact your functionality on your uh, server. 
The second thing is when you need to fix something, you don't need to uh, fix and, and be in a, in a situation that you might break other things. By doing this, you will, you will be able to apply a specific uh, validation, a new specific validation. There are other tools uh, when a validation is not applicable, you can do also encoding. And now after you understand what needs to be done, you need to enforce this policy because this is well known uh, for uh, most of uh, the developers that input validation needs to be done, etc., etc. But now you want to expose it in a, in a fashion that uh, will help your developer consume it easy. Uh, in an easy way and uh, to actually enforce the policy. So this is an example of uh, how you do this. We created a, a generic, let me see, a generic uh, function, a, a generic class that will actually uh, deal with uh, any input validation. We use null to return to the to the specific uh, calling for this class and why null, let me give you another tip. If you will use Boolean in at this step, you might, you might find yourself dealing with this Boolean in a wrong manner uh, when it returns to the code. And by doing this, you can continue with the vulnerable value uh, on your code. By returning null, you will avoid any uh, returning uh, bad information or malicious information to the uh, continuous of the flow. The second part is what actually the developer see. The, the developer needs to do only get valid string and will need to call the relevant uh, specific uh, uh, validator that he wants to consume. By doing this, he will actually, he, he don't know what happened be behind the scenes. He just know that if he use it right, he just call this get valid string put the right validator and is uh, is uh, supposed to be safe on on this one in addition to each validator that we apply we apply also a unit test because when you work in agile sometimes uh, this uh, uh, there is a disorder on delivery of the different subsystem so you cannot run an end to end test and this is a problem that a lot of uh, Agile uh, project facing. We provide a unit test that will help you to measure your performance and to see you, you fetch the expected input uh, and put it on a valid value, as you can see here, and invalid value test. So we run two tests, one for the valid and one for the invalid, and verify that the system work correctly and not fail you. And this happens for each build. When coming to summarize the big picture, we create a, a live person security API. We import it, we force to import it for each project. We enforced our policy by uh, uh, using static code analysis and uh, open source uh, validation and the delivered uh, validation for each uh, building block that it's uh, supply. Finally, when we finalize to write our code, we want to do a check-in. So we use the continuous integration uh, infrastructure to enable us to create builds. And we do this uh, by the developer checking the code. He pu pushed the code into the subversion. Once the subversion identifies the new code, it triggers the Team City. We use Team City as our uh, CI uh, solution. It, it triggers the Team City, and the Maven process uh, start to create your uh, build. Into this uh, build, we just push our uh, security components, meaning we do static code analysis, dynamic test, and open source, and like any other system test that runs into the continuous integration environment, if you will fail, and this is a critical issue, if you will fail, and fail means that we identified any high or medium finding, you will fail uh, the build. So think about it, 
like a developer trying to run his code in his own machine. If he cannot compile it, he will not be able to run it, right? So think about it the same way. If you have security finding, you cannot continue. You need to fix them down, and to fix them now, and don't postpone it and create a backlog. So this way, you will find yourself coming clean each time you push, and of course, clean in a manner of what you know. There is always other steps, but if you know about something, fix it now. Don't wait for uh, find it later on the process or put it on the backlog. Another thing is, as we mentioned, when we think about our customer business and uh, how the task is driven, think about your developer as a customer. Okay, you want to give him a good uh, user experience when uh, uh, facing problem with security. So he's used to check in his code and find uh, and monitor the success or fail of the build in the framework of the team city. Into this framework, we just added a new tab, as you can see here, that shows in what went wrong on his uh, on his build. And if the build fails, he can easily go and see within the tool itself exactly what line went wrong and get assistance uh, online and get help online to help him remediate the vulnerability that was just found. This way you win twice. Once you increase the awareness of your developer. Each time he find a new finding that he creates, he gets well familiar with this finding, he needs to deal with it, he creates self-knowledge to himself, and by this he's, uh, he's improving. Second, you have, uh, you have a sustainable security uh, level of, of knowledge for all your, uh, for all your organization, because this is a standard you cannot pass this standard. You, meet, you need to meet this standard, and by doing this, you are actually uh, good to go. Let, let's summarize what we saw uh, until now, and I will leave a few minutes uh, for questions. So, as uh, we spoke uh, at the beginning, the first thing is to do discovery and identify the right intersection that you need to be involved in order to be efficient in your security uh, life cycle and a security development life cycle. And, and the message here is be part of the process. Don't wait to be at the end of the process. Be involved in each checkpoint. Decide which your R&D, which are the good point that will create the maximum impact on the decision before it happens. And once you uh, become part of the process, it becomes part of the DNA of your R&D, and it's not strange to them. It's not the bad guy that comes with a hat and say, you did this, you did that. The, the developers, it's uh, self-consuming. He goes to the panel, he sees the problem, he gets online help, he resolve the problem, if you need guidance, he calls you, you are always present in his life cycle. Second is reduce friction. You want to reduce friction by uh, setting and consuming your solution and your policy in an easy manner. So put a package, put a set of utilities to be consumed by your uh, developers in a way that will not uh, have to be so heavy process, to be a, a very simple consuming like we saw in the input validation, we do so also for encryption, for anti-SAMI, if someone uh, already deployed anti-SAMI, he knows how friction it is to define the XML file that creates the policy, so on and so on, and, and by, by uh, doing this, you reduce the amount of knowledge that uh, the developer needs to do in order to, to achieve his task. Screen and enforce your policy on what needs to be done. 
We created the policy, we published it to everybody, now we need to enforce it. We, we enforce it by putting, uh, and this brings me to the next point, uh, using automation and collaboration between the different systems. We have a CI environment, we have static code analysis, interact between them, create automation, understand the process you, would, you want to put in place, and once you understand the process, build it into an automated way. The next item is to create confidence with your customer. Don't be afraid. Don't set security by obscurity. Be open. If you have a problem, you want to know about it. You don't want to hide it. You want to, to let others uh, test you and feel confident with the service. If you don't do this, you will be hard to do business with a large enterprise organization. If you are a SaaS provider, you, you for sure know that when it comes to do business, you get to a point where the security teams is involved and start asking questions. What is your data retention policy? What is your, how do you deal with PII? And then if there are uh, findings, you cannot uh, go live with this customer. The second part of the recommendation are more about how you treat your uh, R&D uh, organization. So we at Life Person, a coach and uh, uh, coach champions, uh, you have scrum masters, we have tech leaders, we take them, we take them uh, on hands-on training and creating value to them to understand what is the security problem that uh, can, uh, can be pop up during the, the recession. We, we share, of course, a lot of information uh, uh, and train our uh, developers on a regular basis. In addition, we create a knowledge base, and the knowledge base is not just around about our service. For example, the last uh, incident of Adobe, where they lost uh, more than 100, uh, 153 million uh, records of uh, emails, uh, and user passwords and the security question in clear text. So once a developer sees this, he reads about it. When he comes to do some uh, sort of a thing, he's, he's aware. The, the, the next thing is, and it needs to come with your uh, management decision uh, to break the build. Uh, in a high or medium. To, to approach this uh, step, you will need to feel uh, mature enough to do so, because if you don't, you will create noise, and this noise in R&D will not impact well your day-to-day uh, -day work uh, and will create a lot of tension between the different uh, parties on your uh, company, the ones that wants to ship the, the, the release on time, and, and uh, the one that uh, will needs to go and fix it again, etc., etc. So, so you need to feel confidence, uh, reduce the false positive in the process. In order to do so, what I recommend is to start small but think big. What does it mean? Start with a, a small uh, project. Don't start with uh, annoying everybody in R&D. When you start to do so, you will uh, understand better what are the roadblocks that can uh, face you during this process. Make this a success story and start to convince the other teams to join this program. Uh, step by step, you can uh, see how it grows. And believe me, uh, it wasn't start at the beginning to do so. But once it actually created a success, Teams wanted to join this program and wanted to be part of this process. And today, this process goes for all the subsystem we have at the company. And of course, it's a never-ending story. You need to feed this uh, program all the time uh, to make it uh, alive. Things uh, are getting uh, better. You have new product can, that can help you achieve the the solution.
I'm open to question. Of course, uh, if you will not cover the question, you can uh, ask uh, me during uh, this. Uh, I, I will be available. Hi. Uh, great presentation. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, you said you had 22 uh, Agile teams running. What are the ratio of the security people to that, and what roles do they play on those teams? So we have, very, it's a very good question. We have 22 scrums with 200 developers, and we are five uh, people on the security team. But we have also operational security guys, about uh, three guys, and we also uh, mentor uh, the software architect and uh, others to be part of it. So actually we collaborate with all together because we cannot get to 200, but we are in a very good relation with, with all of them. Yeah, um, with the security tools, the scanning tools, like the HP Fortify, it's taking longer and longer. With more and more rules as they're coming out to scan, even medium-sized Java projects can take three to five hours. How are you, um, are, are, you, are you whittling down or creating a small policy for quick turnarounds in your builds to be able to accommodate Agile projects? How are you addressing some of that? Great question. Of course, at the beginning, we start with each build, meaning each build that uh, was checked in, we, we will check it. So for large project, it becomes a problem because people want to get their artifact as soon as they checked in and they, don't, uh, and they don't want to wait more than five to 10 minutes. So we addressed it uh, in a nightly build, meaning you can check in during the day, no problem. At night, you will uh, run a, a nightly build for a large project and then uh, if you fail, you cannot continue your work. So actually, every build is scanned at, at, a, at a, framework, a time framework of 24 hours. For a small, for small project, every time that you checked in. So one of the things people in my company were concerned about, they said, okay, during these scrums and sprints, suppose somebody changes a design. Suppose they decide a different protocol, it's a different way to do stuff. How do you find out about that? You just rely on their awareness that that's important? Is there an artifact they create that you can check? How do you catch decisions that are security impacting in the middle of their process? So it's about awareness of uh, the teams approaching you with the question and find it during the sprint planning. But uh, if your subsystem needs to speak with another subsystem, you, you cannot create this uh, established connection be, be, uh, if you don't go to the uh, software architect. And we are very tied to the software architect. We work in, a, in very close mode with the software architect, so any change coming from this uh, path, we will be involved. There is no uh, slip away on, on this one. But that's because they're aware of it, right? There's no document that they make a check mark in that you see there's been a change. It's just those people are aware of what's important to you and they go to you. Sure. Okay. Uh, and there is no way that uh, I will not speak two or three times a day to a software architect uh, during the day. Any more questions? There. Oh. Of course, the, the test should not be intrusive. And no, no low test. Right. It's, it's a legal act. You, they signed on a document before they start the pen test, okay? Uh, Sorry, could you uh, just explain a bit yeah. more about how you got management buy-in? Because um, you said that was quite important at the beginning, and obviously it must be very important to get everybody to do this. I was kind of curious how you got that. Sure. I think because of our nature of, of the service, uh, we, we work with big finance institute. Uh, most of the bank in the U.S. are customers of ours. So... You follow a very long security questionnaire and audit before you start your service. Once you go to this type of uh, engagement with this type of customer, you quickly understand that if you don't have security, 
you cannot do business. This is the alignment. It's business talking here. You don't, you know, if you don't do security, no business. How do you deal with false positives, especially in the nightly bills where you break the bill and then realize it was a false positive? False positive, so we, we serve our developers and this is priority for, for my team. Meaning, soon as there is an issue, a direct call to one of my team uh, or to me uh, will immediately get a response. We look into it, we resolve the issue, we understand. If we have a false positive and it cannot continue, there is time uh, going to waste uh, from the developers. So, so we are we are aware as a security team to the R and D needs. So I, th I think, uh, in terms of time, I'm done. Or do we have? Thank you. Thank you.